Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second in this fall 2021 Knowing Africa series. I think those of you who are regulars uh, know that this is a, a seminar program that is um, designed to bring um, the best of uh, work on Africa by Africans into a conversation and uh, is an you know, attempt uh, on the part of um, the Institute uh, to locate Africa as a space of theory making, not a space of extraction for the purposes of theory. And so each of the seminars that are uh, in our series are designed to introduce you to the best of this thinking and to provoke an engagement with scholars based um, in many parts of the world. Um, I'm delighted, I can't say how particularly delighted I am to have uh, my colleague, sister um, from uh, South Africa, Pumla Dine Otola, who is here today to speak about her latest book, uh, The Female Fear Factory. For those um, of you who may not have encountered Pumla, she is uh, Africa's leading uh, public intellectual and uh, one of the leading academics um, working in the area of gender studies um, and on the question of um, how to understand the dimensions of gender-based violence, our ongoing pandemic, uh, not only in Africa but across the world, uh, Pumla's work has been absolutely influential in global terms and uh, she is far and away uh, the most uh, insightful uh, thinker on these questions uh, and she's been working at those questions for a very long time and from a range of different perspectives. So the Female Fear Factory is not her first book on this uh, topic but it is the book which with, its, with the greatest geographical reach uh, and an extension of her theoretical um, interventions on the questions of patriarchy in Africa. Um, and, and so uh, this sort of extremely creative uh, mind, uh, I think is going to engage us very well today. Pumla is also uh, the, has the best title uh, in the world. She's the professor of African feminist imagination and she holds, for which she holds the South African Research Chair at Nelson Mandela University. And anyone whose email ends at mandela.ac.za, well done. Um, so Pumla, you know, in, in a multiplicity of ways from your, um, your innovative path-breaking work, your, your policy, uh, um, your political interventions that go well beyond the policy debates. Um, Pumla was on the ministerial panel on gender-based violence in South Africa, for instance. Um, you've been uh, what they, we would call in South Africa a thought leader. Uh, so welcome to you. And in conversation with Pumla today, we have two other uh, very um, uh, important intellectuals. Uh, Bibi Bakari Yusuf is, hasn't quite joined us yet, so we're hoping she will join us if a little bit late. She is um, a, uh, someone who was an academic who made the big bold move out of academia, having got her PhD from Warwick University, made a, the big bold move to get out of academia uh, and into the world of publishing uh, in the, her project in the Cassava Republic Press, um, which was a, a kind of, I think, dramatically important intervention um, to bring African writing uh, to the fore, to, to seek out the best African writers, publish them and make the work available, uh, not only to the world, but also, and just perhaps more importantly, to people uh, in Africa to expand that reading public and uh, uh, to, to reshape uh, the 
the relations of reading uh, on the continent. Along the way, she also um, picked up an uh, amazing election to the Royal Society of Literature. She was a Yale uh, fellow and a Desmond Tutu fellow. Um, and uh, for all my students, I uh, know her amazing article, um, uh, which uh, addresses the question of doing gender in Africa, which we, uh, you know, we read for its theoretical insights uh, and, and has a lasting uh, impact, certainly in my uh, teaching on gender in Africa. And then we have uh, our colleague uh, down the way, uh, Yolanda Buka, who is an uh, assistant professor at uh, Queen's University in IR and political science, uh, who has uh, done uh, also uh, interesting work on violence, uh, not just against women, but as uh, 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 in her work, um, in the Institute of Security Studies in Nairobi, in her work um, as a kind of analyst for a range of global bodies and her academic work on uh, Rwanda in particular has made contributions to our thinking about violence, peace, keeping uh, on the continent and who is uh, currently working on uh, in the area uh, of gender-based violence, as well as other forms of political violence. Uh, and yeah, so welcome Yolanda, it's wonderful to have you as a discussant. So Pumla is going to tell us about the book first and her main propositions in the Female Fear Factory. Um, the book uh, will, uh, Bibi Bakari Yusuf is bringing the book out globally, am I right, Pumla, next year. But for South Africans, they've already had a taste of the book. Um, it's already out. It's coming out under a great cover, uh, two great covers, uh, if you judge books by their covers. Uh, yes, but it'll be out globally in a, couple of, in a few months. So Pumla, welcome, and I'm handing the mic over to you. Thank you very much, um, Shireen, Professor Shireen Hassim. It's very good to be here. Um, for thank you to for the, your invitation to talk to you and your colleagues and your students. I recognize a few names, so I'm delighted that they're here too um, to talk about the Female Fear Factory. And of course, thank you to um, Professor Yolanda Buka and um, soon to be joining us. I hope um, Dr. Bibi Bakari Yusuf who's also um, the, who's publishing house, um, Cassava Republic Press, is, the, is, 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 my, um, is, is one of my publishers, publishers for the Female Fear Factory um, and for, for North America, um, West Africa and the, 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 the UK. As entry, let, me, let me share aspects from two cultural texts. One, a media text broadcast on television, and another from a book of essays. Both are products of the African feminist imagination. In April 2021, the South African feminist media organization, Seoul City Institute, flighted several public service announcement style videos on several television channels on the public broadcaster SABC, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, alongside their new talk show, It's a Feminist Thing, season one. In one of these, we see the juxtaposition of two young people in exercise gear in their homes, getting, to, getting ready to leave their homes for a run. We are prompted to read them as a man and a woman and their actions are juxtaposed. The man checks his step counter, grabs his keys and leaves his home. The woman checks her step counter, shares her jogging route with a contact on her phone, grabs her keys, fidgets with them somewhat, hesitates, returns to her desk to pick up a pepper spray, pepper spray, and then leaves home for her jog. From a different location on the temporal, on temporal and geographic plates, we read, and this is a quotation. One day, 
When I was four years old, a man stopped his car on the street under my family's balcony in Cairo, pulled his penis out of his pants and beckoned to me to come down. He did the same to my friend who had been talking to me from her family's balcony from across the street. I was so small, I needed a stool to see my friend from above the balcony railing. I was enraged at that man, even though I was a child. How dare he ruin our reverie? Two little girls, happy, oblivious to the street below, which was mostly quiet and therefore perfect for our cross balcony afternoon conversations. It was our time together. How dare he interrupt us, end of quote. The second, which I've just read, the quotation I've just read, is Egypt several decades ago, a story told by Egyptian feminist or Egyptian American feminist, Mona al Tahawi, in her second book, the, Se the Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls. I begin with these two references. First, for the obvious ways in which they illustrate aspects of the phenomena I have dubbed the female fear factory and initially did so in my 2015 book, Rape, a South African Nightmare, where I dedicated a chapter to the ways in which fear is a crucial technology of control under patriarchy and one that is constitutive of rape culture. In that book, the female fear factory, which I also sometimes called the manufacturer of female fear, was a very important conceptual cog in explaining the logics, locations, and specific historic textures of rape in South Africa. In my most recent book, the one we will be spending time on today, the one over which we gather today, Female Fear Factory, I was motivated to spend the space of a book to teasing out the ways in which fear works as a political apparatus of patriarchal control. And here, my second reason for starting as I have today with these two cultural texts. The television advert and essay also, essay extract, also speak to scale. Because to think through the lens of the female fear factory is always also to think through scale. Soul City Institute's advert, like Al Tahawi's recollection, work with the boundaries of the intimate and public, movement between these, the intrusion of a public consciousness and a gendered sense of unentitlement into the psyches of the toddlers and the woman jogger. Johannesburg, South Africa and Cairo, Egypt also frame different ends of the continent in geographical, cultural, conceptual ways, and yet they are intimately linked. 1981 Cairo is very dissimilar to 2021 Johannesburg, yet they are linked in this particular patriarchal syntax. And there are obvious aspects to the female fear factory and less obvious ones. These stories I began with pretend to be simple, yet I make them do hard work in this talk. In the book, Female Fear Factory, I make deceptively simple stories from the Nigerian Academy, Saudi Arabian streets, Hollywood, El Salvador, Brazilian politics, Indian publics, transport, British television, a Kenyan court case, and so on, do serious work. Perhaps I should offer this disclaimer. I'm a professor of literature, so the detail, theory, difficulty, art, and possibility are always in the deceptively simple story. There is no such thing as a simple story if you pay attention. So as I now turn to trace the genesis of the concept of the female fear factory from chapter to book, such narrative is also, I hope, one of scale, of conceptual shifts and of very deliberate writing and representational and aesthetic praxis, because all of these have materiality. So as I thought of the female fear factory initially in Rapist South African Nightmare, um, the naming was both accurate and metaphoric. The female, I wrote, the female fear factory, I thought of the female fear factory in these terms. The female fear factory is as theatrical as it is spectacular. By theatrical, I, I allude to its exaggerated performance in front of an audience in terms that are immediately understood. 
It is spectacular in its reliance on visible, audible, and other recognizable cues to transmit fear and control. Performed regularly in public spaces and mediated forms, it is mythologized, sometimes through a language of respectability and other times through shame. The Female Fear Factory, which I also call the manufacture of female fear, although I get into some trouble sometimes for, for this by, by scholars of capital who say you can't talk about a factory and, and, and manufacture in, 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 you know, in, in, as synonyms. Well, the Female Fear Factory, which I also call the manufacture of female fear, relies on quick, effective transfer of meaning. To normalize it depends on a combination of seemingly contradictory processes. Frequent repetition of performance until the performance becomes invisible. In other words, when we see and hear something over and over again, we stop seeing it and hearing it. It retreats into the background like static becoming white noise. We come to expect it as part or in a process of partial desensitization. Once this happens, its interruption becomes strange, dangerous, and unthinkable. The manufacture of female fear uses the threat of rape and other body wounding, but sometimes mythologizes this violence as benefit. Under capitalism, we know that work is codified as respectability. Those who are without work are shamed, while those who work are often said to have dignity. To want to work redeems the worker from a freight of uselessness, dependency, and laziness. To those who seek to take the factory apart, want to determine compensation or want to own their labor, or those who do so are often demonized. Like a real factory, the female fear factory takes up physical space, public physical space. It requires many bodies and different components. It, it works like an assembly line. There are consequences um, to its interruption. And although the product is female fear, its products are also generalized fear in all audiences. And now when I initially thought about the female fear, tree in the fear factory in these terms, I was trying to make sense specifically of how fear works as part of rape culture, as a way of, 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 of locking us into a rape crisis in the South African context, um, and how fear can work in a more generalizable way to help us understand um, fear as a, as, a, as a political construct, not simply fear as, as, as affect, not simply fear as, as, as emotion. And how, in fact, the very consciousness globally um, and in South Africa, in South Africa and, and globally, the very consciousness of fear as one of what um, we often are socialized to think of as a fundamental emotion is in fact implicit in 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 this in this in this in this in this capacity of fear to do political work. So um, one in different parts of the world, you are often told, for example, nobody is really fearless. It's human to fear something. And so then when you have, and so then the, 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 that kind of seemingly commonsensical sense of fear as a universal, as part of the universal human experience, um, colludes in part then with the, with the masking, with the invisibilization and with the normalization of the female fear factory or fear generally as a technology of control. I think political scientists have done quite some work here in, in helping us understand that fear is not simply an, an, an emotion, but it is a it is a, it is a, it is a, it, it is, it is kind of does political work. It has a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a technology of control that, that has worked um, across different epochs and different um, geographies. In Female Fear Factory, I work hard to understand what all of this means. The theatrical performance that was so clear to me as I wrote Rape is an African Nightmare. Now, as I grapple with, um, with, 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 with the meanings and the locations of Female Fear Factory again, demanded that I spend quite some time thinking about constructions of public, publicity, publicness, 
And what Dinali Gaga explains are routes to how women become visible in different um, parts of, of um, in, di in different parts of the world. Um, and in, in Lee Gaga's work, she's looking specifically at different um, parts of the African continent that have a settler colony history specifically. This leads me to thinking about publicness and, and theatricalness and trying to expand it in the new book. Leads me to understand and theorize that just as I had previously insisted that rape is a language, not a moment, that the female fear factory works itself in ways akin to language, that it is a political idea and a language logic system. So what I had initially thought of as kind of the, or talked about as normalization of, of fear and desensitization in the South African nightmare felt as I revisited as insufficient to explain how the desensitization, the normalization is learned, how um, the female fear factory is learned um, as, I, as I later realized. And so in the female fear factory, I explain in the, the book, I explain that the female fear factory as concept requires a specific pattern of acquisition, literacy, and ultimately fluency. And I use the language of language acquisition deliberately um, because the female fear factory relies on not just a ready, receptive, primed audience, but also one that has quite a sophisticated grasp of the quick ways in which the female fear factory um, works, is transmitted, is performed, circulates. And so I explained the female fear factory, um, that the female fear factory requires a specific pattern of acquisition, literacy, and ultimately fluency. Fluency is what is at play in the case of the woman jogger. I spend a chapter in female fear factory talking about how fluency um, is acquired and, and importantly, of course, that the sites of fluency are not only sites that we would conventionally or easily connect to violence or sites of violence, that in seemingly mundane, everyday um, practices, communicational forms, um, social techniques, play um, um, exchanges, um, we are, there is a socialization of into this fluency of the female fear factory. So I look at a range of, 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 of forms of literature from linguistics to kind of to, to, to work that looks at the ways in which um, gender is taught in, in playgrounds in different, in different, in different contexts, where I notice for a way where I learn from this, from this enormous body of scholarship, for example, that um, the, 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 that part of how um, women and those who are constructed as female, I'll come back to the latter um, in, um, in this address, are often taught obedience or fluency in the, in the female fear factory through the, 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 the constant invitation to be careful. Fluency is why the public rehearsal of the threat of rape or other harm is quick and why it needs to be public. Thinking about public in the many traditions through which we think about notions of the public, publics, and the process by which things move into and become public into visibility sometimes, about ownership and policing, helps me fine tune the machinations of the female fear factory or the manufacture of female fear. Because certainly in this book, I'm very concerned with how it works, where it works, what it's hidden, patterns are, what its obvious patterns are, but also what its hidden patterns are, um, what it means. And ultimately, of course, as a feminist in the world, as a feminist writer, as a feminist academic, I'm ultimately interested in understanding it in order to contribute to what we need to undo the logic of, of, of the female of the female fear factory or an undo female fear factory and ultimately um, um, patriarchy. Well, not ultimately patriarchy, as part of the anti-patriarchal um, commitments. And so I pay attention then to the ways in which in this book, I, 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 as I've said, I, 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 I draw on examples from very different geographical locations deliberately. And as I do so, I think it's important 
to juxtapose um, both places from different um, kinds of societies, different kinds of locations, different kinds of texts that seem to be revealing aspects about their societies that have nothing to do with one another in order to show patterns um, of the female fear factory or the production of the female fear factory in different or of female fear in different in different in different aspects. I look at um, specific um, I use specific narratives that exist in the concrete historical world so in the real world as well as fictional texts and I make no um, no distinction about the, at the at the at the level of value. Ultimately, what is important um, for me to analyze as I do so, as I, as I, as I trouble the borders of, of, of different genres and different texts, is to look at what um, each of these sites reveal to us um, through mythology, with, through that mythologization into either respectability or shame or a range of other um, roots, how the, the female fear tree is in fact um, 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 constructed, how it's kept alive, what its logics are, how it's taught, and also, of course, in each chapter, um, and this is a this is a this is a this is an unapologetic commitment. In each chapter, each chapter, I'm not, I am, I am, I am disinterested, perhaps even more so, uninterested in simply illustrating how the female fear factory works. Um, I am uninterested in simply reciting a litany of complaints. I ultimately, as a feminist in the world, as a feminist scholar, I am interested also in amplifying the ways in which the female fear factory is interrupted, how it can be undone. And the commitment ultimately is to understand it only in order to unmake it. And so each chapter then, the ways in which I use, I suppose what can loosely be called story, is in order both to illustrate the ways it works and also to amplify um, feminist attempts or proto-feminist um, attempts and efforts um, of its undoing. I think that when we are talking about scale, it's important to think about um, patriarchy. And I know, um, well, it, I, I've been told that patriarchy is a is a, is a, is a, um, a, a, a very prominent feminist um, in conversation recently said to me, um, you seem to believe in patriarchy a lot more than I do. Um, you know, you seem to really believe in patriarchy. Um, it was interesting because we were reading each other's books and, and I don't think the word patriarchy, and we're both feminist scholars and actually trained in the same discipline. I don't think the word patriarchy um, appeared once in her book, whereas I think it was on almost every page um, in mine. So that was that was a very interesting, um, but yes, I, 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 I try to keep an eye on, on patriarchy and, 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 and to say so is to say that I'm interested, um, I suppose I'm an old fashioned kind of feminist um, in the sense that I'm interested in systems. I'm interested, so when I'm looking at scale, I'm looking at institutionality, I'm in, I'm, I'm, and so the writing of, in the writing of this text, um, this is why this is part of what I mean when I say I make my stories do very, very hard work um, because I'm ultimately interested in scale because I'm interested in, 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 in systems and in institutions. I'm interested in, 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 in these as they by trace and they set up um, the female fear factory. It's high circulation, it's mediation, it's powerful communication systems. Whether we're talking about the media or whether we're talking about the academy, um, in many ways, I'm asking similar questions. One of the things that I that took me by surprise in the writing of this of this of this of this book um, that I felt pulled towards that I wouldn't um, have foreseen. So when I named the chapter "Female Fear Factory" in Rape of South African Nightmare, I was being a little mischievous. I just I liked the alliteration. I, I thought "Woman Fear Factory" doesn't um, it's not as aesthetically interesting. But of course, in this revisiting of the concept, the female fear factory, I realized that actually I meant all women, but I didn't only mean women. That, 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 that in fact, there was something that, 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 that the, the use of female in Rape of South African Nightmare in, in, in that chapter was not simply in the ways we have come to understand 
as, as, a, as a biological marker. And so part of what I do in Female Fear Factory is to argue that, yes, of course, we know that there's a female that the biologist, bi the, the, the geneticists and the, you know, are, are interested in. But human beings are ultimately social beings. And there's a way in which female has become a social category. And so I argue that the fear factory produces the female. Um, it produces the female. And the female, of course, is are, 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 are various um, of patriarchy's others. All women are always patriarchy's other. But there are also other categories of and other genders that are sometimes um, made into female um, and to be made female um, is to be is to be rendered legible for safe terrorization right so it, it, they the, 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 so female is the production so both the the factory produces both femaleness and fear and in fact needs to produce um, both 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 of those and so I travel then um, what is sometimes some of my favorite um, uh, uh, feminist literature um, to say, well, no, perhaps the work that we do often when people say female and as feminists we say, no, female is not, it's not female, it's woman. Um, and we assume that there's an error. And in fact, perhaps there isn't an error, there's a creation of another category. And what happens, we follow that category, not accept the category, but follow what is being produced in that moment. And how that then also works um, to create to create um, this phenomenon called um, female fear factory. I am interested in this book. I'm 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 wrapping up, Shireen. Um, I'm interested in this book about. I'm interested in the dangers of its interruption, and and as well as the possibilities are presented by the interruption of of the female fear factory. I think often. One of the questions that, that, that has come from, you know, my students, sometimes from, 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 from other people when you do feminist work, um, has been the question of, well, I mean, if you feminists keep saying patriarchy is this big system that is global, I'm just one little person, and you are all very nice and brave, but, you know, is there a chance? What do we, and I think that, and so for me, that is part of the commitment also. So the, 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 the commitment to, to, to amplifying um, the possibilities of its, of, its, of, its, of its interruption, which is why I write the chapters in the way that I do, not only never leaving the female fear factory simply illustrated. I also think it's very important um, in my own work, in my own work um, to juxtapose stories from places that don't usually make sense alongside each other. And so I start by, by using an example of asking the question really indirectly through, this, through, through the juxtaposition, what does, um, how can you read um, Saudi Arabian feminists um, campaigns for the right to drive with, um, the experience of a young woman in post-apartheid um, Southern Africa, where women drivers are taken for granted. Um, they're so commonplace that, that, that you know, nobody thinks about, about that. Now those societies are theoretical, I mean, those societies are miles apart, are worlds apart conceptually in the fabric and so on. And, and yet there's something very instructive about looking at the, the locations, the expressions, the production of, 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 of who belongs to the public, who the public belongs to, and how fear works to seeming superficially different ends, but ultimately, as I show, very similar ends. I juxtapose um, different kinds of, 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 of stories, as I said, um, sometimes legislation, sometimes the academy, um, I go to India, I go to, and this is also important because I think that this is also partly a return to scale, right? I'm interested in, 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 in the textures of fear from, from the innocuous to the planetary. I'm interested um, also in what it means to, to, to continue at every exploration of different aspects of the female fear factory, its production, its interruptions, its illustrations, to always be attentive to it as something that is systemic, systemic. 
and, and, I'm, and I'm going to end on this because I think that increasingly, and this is why I call myself often an old fashioned feminist, um, increasingly I find while it is wonderful that, 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 this, that, that there's been an explosion of self-identification as, 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 as feminist, one of the things that I find often difficult is, is, the, is, the, is the embrace of, of choice and agency um, outside of systems. And so I think it's, 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 it's in order to be able to think about, to be able to think about creating planetary, planet-wide, worldwide, I'm trying not to say global, um, <laughs> um, shifts and change and, 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 and the new world seems to me demands that we think about structures and systems um, and, 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 of, and of gender power and of patriarchy um, and all systems of power as institutional, not simply what those that we can confront merely at the level of choice um, and, and, and agency. I'm going to stop there. I think I've more than used up my time. Thank you. That was fascinating and such an amazing and lucid development of the ideas that first emerged in a rape of South African nightmare and such, a, such an adventurous expansion uh, beyond the South African context. So thank you very much uh, for that. So I'm going to ask Yolanda to go first. Bibi Bakare Yusuf has now arrived, but we'll still, Yolanda, if you don't mind, uh, just a little intervention from you before we move to... Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am, I'm the junior scholar in, in the room, very, very much junior and, and much a fan of, of all my uh, co-panelists today. Um, I want to make five, maybe five points about Pumla's work. Uh, first, I, I want to gush over how much I'm a fan of her work. Um, and how her work really speaks to me as a feminist, but also as a as a political scientist. I've told her that I think in another life, I think she was she was she was a political scientist. Um, so I want to throw her flowers for this work and for sharing this work and this analysis, not only to South Africans but to the entire world, because I think it's important. And her methodology is the first point that I want to kind of put my finger on. Um, Mythologically speaking, if you read her book, and when you'll have a chance to read her book, she really starts by walking the reader through the birth of the idea. And it may seem mundane, but as scholars and intellectuals, we often arrive to an idea and present it to the world. And we're trying to convince the reader that our idea is a good idea. And what she does, in fact, is really a service to junior scholars, but also new intellectuals and showing the hum humility that is necessary to allow an idea to evolve and to grow in its own right. She starts with a chapter and then evolves that idea through observation, through her engagement and other readings of other scholars to then come up with this book of the fear factory. So this idea of walking us through her process is actually quite pedagogical. How does one start with a simple idea and then can, theor and then can move on to theorize about this particular concept? Still in methodology, I love the way, as she mentioned, she uses story not as illustration, but as evidence themselves and the arguments themselves. And I think from a feminist perspective, regardless of which discipline you're in, you have to convince your audience that their, the story itself is important in not illustrating, but as evidence itself. I know that people like uh, Fanon and Du Bois have talked about the importance of the experience of, of what she tells the audience beforehand. As you're embarking on this journey, just know that the stories themselves are the argument, whether we're taking the stories from India, we're taking them from South Africa or the United States. And I think it's an important mythological, but also pedagogical tool to share with people who are reading um, this work. Um, the second point that I, I, I want to, to highlight is for me how I've read um, Puma's work over the past few years and, and really see it in conversation with people who do international feminist international relations. Um, one of the key work that um, com comes to mind as I'm reading The Fear Factory is this, this work by Mary Hawksworth on the femicidal state. 
and how um, the, the state is, is perceived not only as complicit, but productive of femicidal policies and norms and behaviors in our own states. And it's linked to one of this, um, this myth that she's talking about, right? She, she, she talks about the, the, the myth of, of protection, that we, we, if we follow certain scripts, we should be safe, you know, and she goes through four or five different scripts. One is about the way we dress. One is where we locate ourselves in our own geographies and how late at night should we go out. And if we, if we go out with a man, maybe we'll be protected. Um, that if we make enough money, these are all the myths that we're told as we're growing up. And I'm speaking here from a position of, of a woman, yeah. Um, if you make enough money and if you're independent, you'll find ways to be protected. And if you defend, if you learn how to defend yourself, um, then you'll have some degree of protection. I want to add to that myth that if you, the other myth that is implicit for me in the reading and linking uh, Oxford's uh, scholarship is the idea that if you are quote unquote, a citizen of the state, you will be protected. That the state has uh, your your, your well-being at heart, that as an equal citizen, you are in fact uh, subject to the state, but also um, a beneficiary of said protection. And I've engaged in recent year with colleagues about my interrogation of the role of the state as a tool of protection for women, because it is not. It is in fact, in many ways, a tool of, of, of violence and oppression for women. So when I link this work of the femicidal state that I think is hovering o around over Puma's work, I also think about uh, Oyewumi in her scholarship to talks about the ways in which the modern African state is in fact a corruption of so many things that we know and, 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 and have come to learn about in, in, in doing genealogy work about African societies. The manly state, as Oyewumi talks about and as Cooper talks about in, in Feminist International Relations, is one that um, disciplines fear, right? So it's, it's the fear of what happens outside of the state that to me really links the type of feminist scholarship that Puma is doing and what other feminist scholars in various disciplines are, are doing. <clears throat> but ultimately, one of the most um, revealing part, the very aha moment when I was reading her work was when she speaks about grammar. Um, and for me, what is particularly interesting about grammar, and here I'll share an anecdote, um, I am originally French speaking. I grew up in Quebec. And when you grow up in Quebec, at least when I was in school, I think things have changed now. They drill you grammar rules. They drill the grammar rules and the exceptions to the rules because French is this complex language, so they say. Um, and when I moved to the United States, I started teaching French. And when I would teach French, I would say, this is a direct object, the indirect object. And nobody knew what I was talking about until a colleague of mine told me, you know, in the United States, we stopped really teaching grammar um, at the elementary school level because it's much more of an intuitive language. So when you talk to students about direct and indirect objects, nobody knows what you're talking about. Yeah, we, we feel grammar, we don't do grammar. And I have a philosophical opposition to this, but this illustration for me speaks to the intuition of grammar, that once you've internal, internalized the grammar, you become invisible. It is um, so obvious that it is the thing that you don't speak about. And it links, again, to another scholar that I really enjoy reading, which is Spiller. In her, scholar, in her article, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, American Grammar, she talks about the ways in which racism and misogyny are so ingrained in American society that in fact, you don't need to have rules that to be written. It is infused in the day-to-day -day norms and grammars of the everyday. And the more fluent, as you mentioned, Pumla rightly, the, the less you actually have to think about it. You quickly discipline people from one side to another without having to give too much of a thought. And what do we then have to do with that fluency as feminists? Is dissect the systems and institutions as you rightfully put in your work to understand not only how the process works, but where we can interrupt it and resist it. 
So for me, as, as I read this book, I, I, I was tickled. I read it on the couch, I read it in, in, in my bed, and I read it in front of my desk, taking notes because from a methodological standpoint, as an academic, I'm really interested in how you tell the story and how you share that story. But also as a feminist IR scholar, I see you in conversation with so much of what is there, but the, your contribution in bringing the mythological innovation and the arguments about this grammar and these rules and these scripts really make what we do not see visible to the naked eye. So thank you so much, Pumla, for your work. Well, thank you for that wonderful appreciation, Yolanda, and for expanding on some of these um, conversations that the book, you know, uh, these arenas the book is in conversation with. Yeah, I also agree with you about the secret political scientist side to Pumla, obviously. <laughs> Bibi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. To It's really great to hear Pumla talking about the book and I need to provide context because I'm here both as Pumla's publisher and editor and as a scholar in my own right. And it's been perhaps po probably one of the most challenging and interesting um, book I've had to edit and publish. And simply because this is a book that directly engages with me as a scholar rather than as a publisher. So how do you publish someone whose writing, whose work you respect. As a, as, a, as a feminist, activist, academic, scholar, and then thinking about it as a publisher where you're trying to publish a book for the marketplace and a marketplace of ideas where you're trying to um, popularize all of this fe African feminist theorizing, African feminist discourse in a way, in, in order to make it make our theory and our practice legible to a broader constituents beyond just the academia. And so it's been really interesting trying to engage with Pumla editorially to really go beyond what we would as scholars take for granted. So language as fluency, uh, legibility, factory, manufacturing, these are incredible terms that need unpacking for many, many people in the world. And a text like female fair, fair factory should never reside in the academy alone. And one of the important work things about Pumla herself is her work across board is trying to always make her text, her book, her writing, more broadly accessible than most, but yet without losing grasp of the importance or the theoretical purchase of the argument. I think that's a really important point to make and to try and in, in doing so, when you encounter female fear factory, you're having to encounter three, for in my mind, to my mind, three very distinct concepts, female fear, Factory. These are concepts that are forcing you to have to think about so many different things. And as Pumla said, we often think of female in a biological sense, but then having to rethink about, rethink female in a broader sense. In term, and when I say broader, for the ways in which society uses the female as it presents us, presents to us. And the ways in which once the female is present to us, it doesn't matter whether it's biological or not. The, the female presenting is presented, is, is read in particular ways. And in, in Female Fair Factory, Kumla is expanding the scope of femaleness beyond the biological to say, let's think about how the body is read. Because essentially it's about how is the female body read? And it's, irrespective of whether you're cis or you're trans or what have you, it is the meaning accrued or imposed on the body. That's the kind of one concept that one has to grapple with is this idea of female fear factory. And then there's fear. 
there's the internal fear that we might feel, we might experience, and then there's the political fear, the ideological, and having to straddle between the internal notion of fear, the emotional, the felt experience, the, affect, the affected idea of fear, and how that is um, that comes together in the public realm, in the public realm of ideas, in the public realm of of the media, of schools, of some of the examples that she marshals together to think about what it means to, to manufacture the female. And it's not just even manufacturing the female, it's the manufacturing of fear. And the fear that gets manufactured in order to induce a certain compliance amongst categories called female or read as female. And I'm deliberately not using women it's category those who have been ascribed as female or irrespective of how they are, who they might be or irrespective of their biology. And then the, so you have the manufact the female, the fear, the, then there's the factory. Here is where she's talking about scale. She wants us to think about scale because, you know, we can think about patriarchy in, um, that has been existent before the factory system, which is part of the capitalist, when we can, when we can think about organized factory system, the, we think about it as part of the capitalist mode of production at its very height. And you cannot think about the factory without thinking about capitalism and, and its other modalities, i.e. slavery, colonization, race, gender, sexuality, all of these things come together to produce certain kinds of bodies. In, in, the, in the world and the factory becomes a way of creating bodies and power relations. And she brings all of these three things together to, um, to really invite us to move just be, beyond just the violence that happens is something prior to violence. The thing that enables the violence to, to take place in the first place so that there is compliance and that complaint can only come into being through fear. And so women come to know women, females come to know their place in the, within the, the world of the factory system. Now, and I think this is really, an, these three things, bringing them together, and because even though Pumla said she was being flippant in her first iteration of the use of female fear factory, I think, that um, this notion of female fear factory is a really important concept, is a gift of, of an African feminist to the world. And we need to um, look at how we, we can begin to use it more to really understand the depth of violence in society, not just the female body, but also the racial body of black people. Because when we think about South Africa as an example, as a society that has been constructed around certain kinds of racial capitalism, right? It means that the what what would it mean to think about the the fee, about fear and factory and then female, what kind what kind of or which kind of bodies are rendered pliable and legible for the factory system that is at the bedrock of the South African economy and the capitalist society to which South Africa has, the modern South African state has emerged from. And that means that we have to think about how um, not just the female bodies now, but also the male bodies that have been rendered female in that system. And this, I think it's, really quite crucial within the South African and also in the black world in general to think about the ways in which in order to reduce, to render black bodies productive, you need to return all black bodies into their reproductive capacity, whether reproductive for the next, um, the next labor, the next laborers or to produce and the question, the question I really want to pose to uh, Pumla, even though I know the answer already, but I would like 
us to discuss it here is when you think about um, female and fear factory and violence in particular, especially think about it in South African or the black world. I know you've used a lot of examples from across the world. Do you think it is important to historicize some of this um, issue around fear, around factory, around capitalist mode of production? And it, do you think it's, it's important, is it necessary that we do so? Because when we're thinking about the space of black bodies being violated, whether it's in, in, in Judge Floyd or, or NSAS in Nigeria, these are forms of violence, forms of instituting fear that did not start today. And therefore, we always have to take a longer durée of history. What, where do you sit within that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Phoebe. And Pumla, before you answer that question, um, I think I think it would be good to have, there, there are already three questions in the chat. Uh, I'm all for humanizing Zoom. So instead of me being the interlocutor between this, these long texts on the side, I, I would like to invite the people who pose these questions to ask them in a brief form. So I'll start Nafisa Isab Sheikh with you. Just uh, if you could unmute and yourself. Hey, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, turn on your video. Yeah. Oh, really? It's quite late here. I don't think you want to see my face. Um, anyway, I'm going to hope that um, the audio is enough. Um, the question is long enough. Um, I suppose it's very similar to what uh, Bibi Bakri Yusuf uh, ended with, which is uh, really that there is a very significant uh, historical scholarship on the creation of patriarchy and patriarchies. Um, these exist in, in different forms and have come from different disciplines. Um, and your idea of the female fear factory seems to be a very modern one and is bound in sort of in literacies and forms of communication um, that are rather a lot newer than patriarchy is, I suppose, or the, the female fear factory, as you say. Um, so I suppose my question is how does the female fear factory or you know, operate to reproduce itself historically through what forms of communication and socialization. I mean, of course, I'm, you know, it's a, a part of this is intuitive. I'm, I'm prompting you, of course, to talk about the family and religion and, and things like that. But uh, it's also to draw attention to an existing historical literature, which does place the creation of patriarchy in very material um, things, the material history of the long durée of human societies in which the sexual surveillance of women sort of arises as a kind of primary need for the reproduction of society. I hope that that is clear. Uh, if it's not, I trust that Professor Shireen Hassan will make it very much clearer. Uh, thanks, Nafisa. I'm going to take with Vinny, Vincenza Matze next, because your question is a little more uh, you know, follows along that line, right? Uh, so Vinny, do you want to go next? Oh, okay, she can't. So, uh, so Vinny's asking uh, a question um, uh, similarly, uh, I guess, uh, to, uh, to Nafisa's, which is how, which is uh, how disciplining, um, of material bodies works uh, in a broader sense uh, here. Um, well, how does the, I, I mean, I think you have talked a little bit about the ways in which concepts of feminine and femininity trouble sex body as biological body. I think you, you've made that point. Um, but uh, I think uh, what Vinnie is asking is, can we get into patriarchy itself and how self-disciplining may work in this process and how we may have uh, internalized surveillance. And I, you know, I think this is very much what your book is about, um, is, is exactly that the production of fear is something that does not need external disciplining because at a certain 
moment it begins to operate from within ourselves. And, and so um, in my reading of your work, Pumla, I think I, I see how you are making this argument very clear that um, the, the disciplining, uh, uh, that fear goes along with disciplining and that it is not just a system that does it to us, but human beings. And it's not just men who do it to us, but women who do it as well within these patriarchal logics, right? So I think that's the question. And then Chris Isike wants to ask a question about men. Chris? Okay. Um, right, okay, so this is very dark now. Um, anyway, thank you. Mine wasn't really a question. Um, it was more like a comment. Um, you know, it's 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 when well, listening to Pumla made me wonder whether we cannot talk about a male fear factory of women. Um, you know, based on the fact that uh, uh, you know misogyny um, and male violence against women, um, like racism, is a product of fear. That's what I wrote in in in, in the chat. So I said I would like to see uh, Pumla extend the female fear factory to men and boys who fear women and girls and respond to their fears and insecurities you know, through, uh, uh, through violence. Because in, in my view, uh, men and boys' uh, uh, fear of women's abilities and agency um, you know, deserve some research in this regard. I've actually done some studies on this question uh, where I questioned uh, young boys and, and men in KwaZulu-Natal um, over a seven year period. And, and, and one of the interesting things I found was the boys, I'm talking about university boys, saying that they recognize that women are smarter, more intelligent than, 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 than them as boys. And so um, when they feel they cannot compete with their intelligence, they just hit them, you know? Um, so the violence then becomes a weapon to respond to insecurity uh, in that regard. So, so it just gave me um, a thought around whether Pumla, would not want to consider um, another book on male fear factory. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Pumla, can we just take Debbie Gates skills and then you have a little bunch of questions uh, to, to address, uh, some linked. Debbie, do you want to ask this question? Yes, yes, it's sure. Very interesting, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just was thinking about the term manufactured and wanting us to just ponder that a little bit more because I'm sure you're not trying to say these fears have no basis in objective reality um, and you're on a different tack, but I just wanted to raise the question, um, are there not objective things to actually fear? You know, this is a huge hot issue in in London at the moment because of the death of Sarah Everard at the hands of a dodgy policeman who, and then more recently, a young, I think she's Asian, I'm not sure, woman who was um, attacked on her way through a park and killed. And uh, so I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, um, Fears are not entirely synthetic. Um, they're not simply manufactured by malign forces. And so I say at the end, don't we have to assess what there really is to be afraid of and sort of root it out and combat it? Um, yeah, so what, what is an appropriate level of fear? <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks, Debbie. Pumla. Any or all of these questions seem relevant? Those are all really big questions. So I'll, I'm gonna try very hard to do them justice, but if I don't, you can always come back and um, push me more. Um, I, and then I'm going to, can I answer the questions and then kind of talk um, to Yolanda and Bibi um, uh, mm -hmm. in the next, uh, first to the questions. Um, so Nafisa, I think that two things that I try to do. So I, first of all, there's a, there's a, there's a question of 
um, what I'm trying to understand is a very particular, I'm not trying to understand um, as I perhaps might do in other projects. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm, at first, first I'm not making the claim that patriarchy um, has always used the female fear factory. I don't think, I mean, I think there's certain things we understand about how patriarchy works as control, as, as regulation, as disciplining, and as reproductive and productive and, and ordering and all of these things. I don't, however, think of patriarchy as something that works in exactly the same time, in the same, uses the same kind of um, machinery, technologies, uh, registers, grammars um, across time. I do think that we can recognize that patriarchy is, is, I don't know, several, many, many centuries old and recognize that patriarchy um, is also, also exercises itself in very distinct kinds of ways at different times. I don't think patriarchy does the same kinds of things in feudal um, Europe, for example, as it does um, in, 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 you know, during the Industrial Revolution as it does um, in, in 2021, right? I think that, I think there is value to, to, to both taking on board the lessons and the insights of how of the long durée of patriarchy and recognizing that there is both something continuous and some distinct aspects in how patriarchy mutates, defends itself, concretizes, strengthens, whatever. So, 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 so um, I, I don't make claims uh, that the female fear factory speaks, is a, is a phenomenon that is possible, that, that, that is necessary for all um, patriarchal societies across time, right? But it is very clearly to my analysis, um, a phenomenon that we have to think about um, as a phenomenon rather than as simply an, an expression here and there, um, as something that we have to think about at a certain um, period in, in, in human history. So that's the first um, thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is, I, 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 it's not bound in literacies and forms of communication that, that, that no, I mean, I'm not interested in literacy. I'm in, fluency and literacies are there for me are radically different um, systems um, and, and, and activities. So, so it, I, 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 and this is why it's so important. This is why I have a whole chapter on, 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 on why the female fear factory needs not literacy, not just literacy, but specifically fluency. And that's why it's so important to think about in very specific language terms and to think about it in, 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 you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a particular kind of languaging um, and, 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 and socialization into a certain kind of languaging and, and, and not a monolingual languaging either. So a language that exists in the midst of you know, a variety of other, of other, of other, of other languages. So no, the female fear factory is not is not necessarily bound up with, with kind of notions of of of, of literacies and and and, and technologies. And in fact, I think my examples um, show all my examples, my stories, um, hopefully show something that that that, that doesn't sit um, as tidily through that. The part where I I think where you link up with what um, BB also raises then is, and, and perhaps um, in a different way also to um, Deborah's question, which is about the language. Okay, so it's about fluencies and it's about grammars and it's about, but it's also, of course, as the wonderful Grace Nicole says, it's also about my own battle with language, right? So when, when Deborah says, well, when you're thinking about it as, a, when you think about it as manufactured, you think about this as, 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 as synthetic, that's incredibly striking to me because I, that's certainly not, you know, if I was saying that I'm talking about the manufacture of female fear, I'm not thinking of manufacture as something that is the production of an unreal. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a manufactured fear in the sense that it's not a real fear that is not material, that is not, um, um, 
that doesn't that, that that isn't legitimate and real and deep. It's it's in fact quite the opposite. It's about it's about, but it is produced. So 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 I use manufacture um, to talk about it is something that is made. But I don't. I didn't want to use words like create. Well, I'm not sure how you talk about production because um, if you say production, if you say creative, I think all of these words come come with well, come with come with certain ideological shortcomings and, 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 and baggage. The point, I suppose, for me is that there's a process. I'm interested in the process and I'm interested in this as something that is, it's not automatic, it's not natural, whatever natural might possibly mean. Um, it is something that is a, an, a, 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 an organized system. So it is incredibly real. It has materiality, it has embodiment. It is not, it is not a fantasy. So to say manufacturers is not to say that which you fantasize, that is that which is which is which is imagined um, and does not correlate to to what you find when you step out of step out of your door. It is in fact what you experience when you're outside your door. In fact, part of what makes it so that there is real fear. So I'm trying to understand how is that real fear created. What are the things that make it possible for certain kinds of bodies and people to be treated in ways that reinforce the fear? And so it's not, and the reinforcement of the fear is part of the production um, that, I'm, that, I, that I'm talking about. And then in terms of the, uh, what else? Uh, the factory, I wanna say something about the factory. Okay, so um, manufacture of female fear, Female fear factory. Yes, the language matters. And um, as 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 Shireen and Bibi know, in my other life, I'm a scholar of slavery. So of course, on the one hand, I have the burden of all of the literature that is, you know, that is 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 is, is the work of my earlier academic career as well, and up to PhD um, or first book um, that is about the industrial revolution and what the factory is and and capital and the factory. But at the same time, I want to be able to speak about the factory, both in material ways and metaphorically. I don't know what metaphor there exists in 2020, 2021, to speak about the large scale production that, that, that I use, that, that we can use factory as shorthand for, right? Because it seems to me that, it, and maybe there is, I just, I just, it hasn't occurred to me. And I hope there isn't a third book where this has occurred to me what this word is. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so if I could just intervene, Pumla, I, I think you're building on a very, uh, a very powerful uh, history of the use of that term, which goes, you know, in a way back to Walter Lippmann and the manufacture of consent. Um, and then got picked up by Chomsky and others in mm -hmm. the book Manufacturing Consent, yes. which is about yes. the way in which that ideological apparatus works. So, so I'm just, I'm just going to throw it in there that, that I think you are on very solid um, theoretical ground um, and are doing something they should have done and did not do, actually, uh, with that concept. So I just wanted to just say that at this point, because it strikes me as not a, um, you know, as it clear to me, uh, I think, Deborah, I think that's an interesting question, but how the, the real uh, connects with the, the manufactured is an interesting question, but I don't see you as using manufactured in the sense of it being a, um, uh, an invented thing or, a, you know, it, it works because there's enough materiality to it to keep it rolling along, right? And also, and of course, because I, thank you, Shireen, absolutely. Um, and I think also, of course, it works for me precisely because it comes from me trying to make sense of rape and how to end <laughs> rape. <laughs> so it, it, it certainly can't be an imag, I mean, and, 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 and how to deal with Remember, the first book is about the South African rape crisis and trying to understand that transhistorically and how to get out of that. So the manufacture of female is not, it's not, it's not in opposition to a real deadly violence. It's in fact a precisely a way to understand how that deadly violence is kept alive, both 
at a physical material level, but also as a way to, as, as Bibi says, to, to, to ensure compliance. Um, okay, and oh my goodness, there's more questions. Okay, shall I do the other questions or shall I go somewhere else? Shall I talk to, am I ever gonna talk to Bibi and? Um... Well, I kind of thought of, I thought of Bibi and uh, Yolanda as, as uh, offering this amazing appreciation of your work. Although Bibi did have the specific question about um, the historical particularity, I think, which was sort of connected a little bit with Napisas, but was about, you know, about the specific manifestations in specific contexts and the big question, uh, which I suppose we all struggle with in, in uh, on the continent, which is when we use the word patriarchy, are we homogenizing too much? Are we capturing enough the particularities of African experiences? Um, and can, you know, so is patriarchy a system that stands above colonial legacies or is it an intersecting system? And if it's intersecting, can we abstract in this way? I guess that's how I would read that question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an important question to keep to always keep in mind. And I think that's why I try to write this particular book, especially in the way that I that I that I have to see how um, the, the, the concept and the idea travels and whether in fact it can. I mean, maybe it wasn't going to travel and then there wouldn't be a book. It would stay a chapter. Um, the, the, the Female Fear Factory as a book would be would be a fantasy, right? Um, a lovely fantasy, but nothing that we could hold in our hands. And so I think part of it is also is testing out, you know, there's the, it was all well and good because I, you know, also, as you know, I, I was done with the chapter. I had no intention. I didn't, I didn't even think it was the most, I actually didn't even think it was the most interesting part of Rape of South African Nightmare. So I'm also a bit taken aback that it's taken on. I thought something, some other parts were much more interesting, but there's no book there, it seems. So, I mean, I think that it's also about testing out, I think, I think it's important to have and to continue to unapologetically generate the language and to test the language to talk about specific ways in which patriarchy does what it, what it, what it, what it, what it does. And I think it's, it's, it's better to come up with and test and then, you know, realize the, 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 the generative potential of those theorizations and the limitations rather than not, right? So I think, I think you know, there's, a, there's one of my favorite um, um, Indian feminists of, of, of violence um, um, and, 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 and women and publicness, um, Shilpa Padke says, um, one of the things that we should be thinking about as, 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 as feminists who work against, um, uh, who write, especially in the academy, writing about how to think about fear and how to think about publicness, she writes, she writes about women and loitering. Mm. Um, she says, well, perhaps we shouldn't be thinking about safety at all. We should be thinking about the feminists making a claim, a feminist claim to the right to take risk. And, and, and you know, I just, I think that that's just a, I mean, I think her formulation is slightly more elegant than I have uh, <laughs> articulated, but I think it's a marvelous um, um, invitation. And so, yes, of course, the language is going to be sometimes inadequate. Um, um, and, 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 and something and, to Chris about uh, men, <laughs> men living here. <Chris>, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, what? no, Chris, I'm not no. going to write a book about men. Um, <laughs> that's the simple part. And then let me just say two more sentences. I'm not going to write about, I don't think there's a male fear factory. Um, I don't think there's a system. And I don't think insecurity is the same as, um, as, 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 as fear. I'm sure that work, um, I, I, I hear what you're saying about the work and the, but, but that would still be part of the female fear factory. It wouldn't be part of the male factory. It would be part of how patriarchy produces certain kinds of masculinities and makes violence available to men in ways that it doesn't to women or it doesn't to those who are made um, um, and female and which men, for example, respond to, again, we could say insecurity is a very human emotion. Um, who, who, who has the capacity and the permission in patriarchy to use violence when insecure and who cannot, um, for whom is it, is, it, is it too risky? I think those questions are still aspects of the female fear factory. I don't think they're aspects of the, 
of the of the of the um, male fear factory. I don't know what the male fear factory is. I, you know what, Chris? You can write the book. Pumla. <laughs> Just to say, um, I think to Chris's point, and this is, and I think my link up to my question around the historizing, historization of violence, and the fact that the in terms of within the South African space, and also the global economy of the production of blackness as well, mm -hmm. has produced mm -hmm. certain kinds of violence on the black bodies. And it's produced mm -hmm. violence on the black bodies in different black male bodies in different in particular ways and female bodies in particular ways, and mm -hmm. so I think you and the, and this level this kind of violence and this historicizing violence may, requires that we think about capitalism, and that was kind of like the question I was trying to ask, and how what is the relationship between the history of violence and capitalism? that also then produced certain kinds of bodies differently, male bodies in particular ways, female bodies in particular ways. And to Chris's question, which was, I think was asking a different question, not to not about female, a male fear factory, but about male fear of female factory. So it's, it's quite slightly different. No, it's that's male fear of females. He's, he, that's what he wrote. Not of females, not, not male fear of the factory. Male, male fear, fear of females, of, sorry, yes. Male of fear females of females that has them lashing out because of insecurity. That's what I yeah. understood. Yeah, yeah. that's already embedded in your, from your that's, already, that's already embedded in your point, in your book, anyway. Mm. Kumla, can I add before you, you, you even address Bibi's question? Because I, I see that question that Bibi's asking so well, because when you were thinking about the disciplining uh, qualities of this te technology of control you're referring to is always about ensuring that women stay, or, or the female that you're talking about remain in their place. And how is you know, women and others staying in their place productive in a capitalist system? What is the relationship of the imperative of this fear factory in allowing women to stay in their place? How is it linked to capitalism? Because for me, the question that I had, I always have just in generally speaking, is that in many societies, in many countries, if you engage in highway robbery, the penalty of engaging in, in violence against property is more severe than violence against women, right? So you can get probation for raping a woman, but you will get 10 years solid for a, a carjacking in a country like the United States, for instance. So if you don't even have to have rules about where women should be at night, then you are saving resources to discipline these bodies in order to produce and do something else. So for me, this question about the relationship of the, the, this female fear factory and capitalism is so interesting. So I would really also like for you to, to talk more, a little bit more about that. Okay, so here's the thing. I think part of the reason that this question keeps coming back is because of this use of the word factory. And, <laughs> and there are parts of my work when I want to talk about factory ad nauseum because I'm writing about the industrial revolution. And then there's this work where I'm trying to do something slightly different, but I hear what you're saying. So perhaps the separation that I'm desiring is not as productive on the page as, 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 as it is in my, in, my, in, my, in my fantasy. So let me answer both your joint question and the different accents you put on, on, on the question in, in, in this way. So, Bibi, I think that, like Yolanda, I think that, yes, of course, we know that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a hit. fear as a political idea is not only used, um, I mean, if you look at people who, who, can have, who, who, do, who are political scientists, Yolanda, you know these people, the people who write about kind of fear, fear as a political idea, the history of, 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 of fear as a political, as a political idea, um, Help us, I mean, they don't, that's not what they necessarily zoom in on, but they certainly help us understand many of the ways in which the black body is produced, um, along with um, all of this, um, this other work that comes about, comes about kind of in, 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 that gives us a sense of how historically 
the black body is produced in different, I mean, across the globe at a certain point, but also in, 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 in very specifically textured or accented ways in different, in different places um, in the world. I think part of my um, willful separation though, of the production, the female fear factory, the manufacture of female fear, fear factory in the South African context and not, so, okay, let me just put it this way. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a current body of scholarship in, 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 some of it is scholarship, some of it is, I don't know what you would call it, what would you call it, Shireen? It's kind of scholarship, but not really. Um, some of it is scholarship. I mean, some of it makes claims to scholarship, but it doesn't circulate in, in ways that allow you to engage it um, directly, which makes the claim that in fact, part of how, which makes us there's a very kind of unapologetically anti-feminist um, argument that in fact, you, if you're thinking about black women and violence against women in the South African context, you have to think about the ways in which black men's bodies are feminized. And once you recognize that black men's bodies in the South African and Namibian context are feminized, you have to realize, then you realize that it isn't really patriarchal violence. And in fact, some of the scholarship directly says, so it is not possible then for men who are feminized themselves to perform patriarchal, patriarchal violence. And so I think that when we're talking about the disciplining and the making and the production of the body through violence, we still have to make the distinction. And of course, the production of black male bodies, of course, is gendered, right? So, 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 uh, it's gendered, and 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 it's and it's and it's and it's um, produced under very specific ways under colonialism, under slavery, under under capitalism, post and during and post industrial industrial revolution. But I am not convinced that that process is a is a is a process that is that can productively be talked about in proximity to. To, to, to the production of, 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 a, of, a, of, of the category female, right? And so I think it's, 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 and it's also again about the way in which we all know that theory and concepts travel, but of course we know that they don't travel, they don't travel in the same kinds of ways and well um, um, every way. So I think that there are also certain landmines that I want to avoid. Right, because I, 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 I am a feminist who's concerned about the world, but I'm a feminist who very consciously and deliberately writes from where I, 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 you know, I, I sit as well, right? So I, so, and I think, and, and, and those are very real and very important um, um, considerations. Can you think about the female fear factory outside of an engagement with capitalism? No, but I don't really think I do that. But what I don't want to do what I don't want to do is to think about, I'm not convinced completely yet that the factory, right? And what I'm calling the factory, which is why I'm, the factory is only the technical factory. So, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the limits of this. I mean, the limitations to this metaphor because the factory is a factory. And so you can't talk about factories outside of capitalism and the industrial revolution and slavery and all of those things. But at the same time, what is a, globally available word to talk about massive sites of creation apart from factories. That is the word that is available. That is the word that in terms of today's literacies makes sense, right? And of course it comes with that baggage. But the reason also that I insist on using female fear factory and the manufacture of female fear um, 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 synonymously is because if you're actually looking at literature on racial capital. It doesn't make sense to talk about manufacture and factory as the same things, right? And so, but when you, because then the manufacturer and the production are different, but, but I'm not interested in the, I mean, I am, but I'm not, I'm trying to get to a point of amplifying and, and grappling with the scale at which this thing is being created, right? But, but if I say created, it sounds random. When I say factory, it, it has the power of the system and the scale that I that I that I that I intend. And I don't know, there is no other word in the English language that carries the weight of factory. But I, the reason I insist on using 
the manufacture of female fear and the female fear factory synonymously is because I don't want female fear factory to be read strictly in terms of how we talk about that factory in, in terms of all of that scholarship that is about that, that is about that, that is strictly about production and, 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 and factory. Uh, it's, a, it's a very unsatisfactory um, distinction and it works against my project, in fact, to not use them in this, in, 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 interchangeably. So that's the thing. I'm not avoiding capital, but I'm not convinced of the way in which I'm not, I'm not convinced that the argument and the theorization that I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate, what I'm trying to study, what I'm trying to amplify is served by the use of the word factory and the word um, uh, uh, manufacture as, 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 denote, as signifiers that denote very specific ring-fenced categories. I like the, the, the porousness, I like the leakiness, and, and, and that's why I'm able to do this. So it wouldn't, it would be a different project. And then I would be doing a project of racial capital. And I'm not, that's, I'm not like, that's not what I'm doing here. I'm gonna have so, to interrupt you because we're over time, Pumla, I'm sorry. I know we could go on talking, but just to do credit to everybody who's come and to, to thank them, I, I want to end it here. But I, I you know, I, 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 I We'll just intervene by saying that I think you use the metaphor very, very, very effectively. And I, uh, you know, I do think metaphors are metaphors. They're not to be kind of used in this absolutely literal kind of way. And then have all, uh, you see something by the use of this metaphor that I think has not been laid out so well. And that, I know you want to say one last thing. So I have a bit of a Linda. <laughs> I, I, but I, I mean, I think that, you know, just to say the best thing anyone can do is, is, of course, buy the book and read it, because you are not avoiding capitalism at all, neither are you avoiding the legacies of colonialism uh, in the way in which you write about it. So, I, you know, I don't think you're making uh, some of the, the uh, categorical errors that perhaps some people feel. Uh, but of course, we haven't all read the book. So the book uh, has been, um, maybe kindly put the link to purchase the book, um, pre-order the book on Amazon into the chat. If you scroll yes. up, you will the find it. Reading. Please uh, go to that link, read African Women, cite African Women, support African publishers. That's my... Uh, slogan for the day and as you can tell definitely uh, extremely um, powerful book uh, that you have given us um, Punda so thank you very much I, I'm going to just close and then you we can those of us want to stay in chat can stay in chat I want to fight with Chris a little bit more uh, but <laughs> uh, next the next seminar is going to be um, in um, November because we have a reading week break coming up and so on. And that is going to be Emily Bridges book on young women in the South African uh, struggle. And we'll have Rachel Sandwell who's with us from McGill University as a discussant. And I'm going to completely, because it's right in my wheelhouse, I am going to breach the host duties. And I'm also going to have a lot more to say about that book and act as a sort of host discussant. Um, but Pumla, you know, thank you. And thank you, everyone. And if you have to leave, please leave. And perhaps we could stop the recording now, but we can carry on arguing. So Pumla, I know you want to come back on something. 